All right, welcome everyone to this first CSSR webinar of the fall 2020 term titled Under Siege, Islamophobia and the 9-11 Generation. And we have the wonderful Jasmine Zine here with us today from Wilfrid Laurie University to talk about her brand new book. Here it is in physical form. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I'm your chair, Sarah wilkins Flam from the University of Waterloo. And so how this webinar is gonna unfold for the next half hour or so so Jasmine's going to talk about her new book, um, and then we'll go on to Q&A. Uh, the chat is open at all times, so you're welcome to post questions or comments in the chat um, uh, throughout the presentation. And then I'll be monitoring the chat for questions, and then I'll kind of poke you during the Q&A <laughs> if you have a question to ask, or you can also raise your virtual hand. Um, but while Jasmine is presenting for the first part of this webinar, I ask you that you remain muted uh, during the presentation uh, to cut down on background noise. And and uh, I'd like to make the land acknowledgement that the University of Waterloo, where I'm based today, and Wilfrid Laurier University, where Jasmine uh, works, are both situated on the Haldeman Tract, land that was promised to the Haudenosaunee of the Six Nations of the Grand River, and is within the territory of the neutral Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples. Okay, so without further ado, Jasmine, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, and welcome everyone today. Thank you for being here, and I really appreciate Sarah organizing this forum and the CSSR for allowing me the opportunity to speak about my new book, um, Under Siege, Islamophobia and the 9-11 Generation. So <clears throat> I'll go through some slides and talk a bit about some of the highlights within the book and then look forward to a uh, conversation after. So, um, you know, my, my book is uh, the tagline is looking at it as an ethnographic exploration of how the 9-11 generation of Canadian Muslim youth navigate Islamophobia during times of war and terror. Um, I'm often asked why I chose to do this research. And in the book's preface, I described three drivers that motivated this study. <clears throat> the first was the experience of my sons growing up as part of the 9-11 generation and how that impacted them. And so, for example, my older son <clears throat> is named Osama, which was not an easy name to have after 9-11, and he was subject to uh, a lot of harassment uh, as a result of it. My younger son was an actor since he was uh, about 13 years old and found over time he was continually being asked to read for the role of terrorist number two. And so those were some among two small examples. There's many of sort of watching my own um, sons who are part of the 9-11 generation grow up and have to navigate that very fraught terrain. I also was struck in comparing the experiences that they were going through um, as they got, you know, older as well and we're in university and we're, we're part of the Muslim Student Association and I was comparing this with my own experiences uh, as a Muslim uh, student a part of a, an MSA or Muslim Student Association back in the late 80s and 90s and how some of the community events that we organized back then would have set us up for surveillance by Canada security agencies if we tried to have those events held in the current climate today. And then the third impetus for me was seeing one of my students um, want to join a nonviolent reactionary Islamist group because that group was using Islamophobia as a call for followers to, you know, to have them adhere to their very narrow worldview and this call for a return to a caliphate system. So those were the three drivers that prompted me to want to examine uh, the experiences of Muslim youth who were coming of age, uh, you know, during a time of war and terror. So <clears throat> we talk about the 9-11 generation and um, what group that refers to. Um, the 9-11 generation of Canadian Muslims has, uh, uh, have, as I've already noted, come of age under unique circumstances where their identities have become reconfigured as radicals, jihadists, and serving for a foil that made the Western imperial project seem intelligible, reasonable, and just. Other studies <clears throat> um, prior to mine also tried to examine some of these issues among this unique um, generation. 
So after surveying 120 Muslim students and university students in Toronto, um, Katie and McDonald uh, found that 94% of them agreed or strongly agreed with the statement, I see a change in the way others view me since 9-11. Uh, <clears throat> Sunaina Myra's research in the United States on American uh, Muslim youth in the post 9-11 context asserted that, quote, living with accommodating or resisting surveillance are part of the coming of age experiences of the 9-11 generation. And then a more recent study by uh, Abdul Fattah in Australia. Um, she looked at Australian youth and found that they, quote, felt the need to tame their Muslimness to strategically erase and conceal their identities. So uh, adding to uh, these findings, I also wanted to examine some of these dynamics and processes that the 9-11 generation of Muslim youth were um, dealing with and, and trying to navigate. <clears throat> so it kind of took me back to this question that was posed by W.E.B. Du Bois back in the early 1900s when he said, how does it feel to be a problem? So he talked about this in the souls of black folk and he said, quote, it is a, a peculiar sensation, this double consciousness, this sense of always looking at oneself through the eyes of others, of measuring one's soul by the tape of a world that looks on in amused contempt and pity. So my research draws attention to the way the 9-11 generation is grappling with Du Bois' question and how they feel and react to being constructed as a problem in Canada. So as a bit of an overview of this um, study, it was uh, ethnographic research that I did was Shirk funded and it was a national study that involved in-depth field work with Muslim youth across Canada. So I spoke with 130 youth, youth workers and religious and community leaders who self-identified as Muslim, and they comprised 23 uh, different ethno-racial groups. And the interviews took place from coast to coast, from New Brunswick, Ontario, Quebec, and BC. And they took place um, over a period of six years from 2009 to 2015. And then in 2016, I also went back to do some uh, member checks and collaborative theorizing with a subset of the participants. So <clears throat> some of the dominant themes that I want to um, uh, flag in the book um, deal with, first of all, looking at the affective registers of Islamophobia in terms of how it has impacted identity, citizenship, and belonging for the 9-11 generation, these sort of post-9-11 identities that uh, emerged. Uh, I also looked at Islamophobia and the security industrial complex, since that's a very salient experience uh, and uh, problem that Muslim communities have faced also since 9-11, the securitization of their um, identities and faith, and how uh, I was interested in how that impacted Muslim youth uh, as well as what they thought about this idea of being uh, of radicalization and what um, being cast as the kind of contemporary folk devil or boogeyman meant um, for them. And finally, I didn't want to end this book, um, you know, with the idea that Muslim youth were simply victims of these, you know, political circumstances. Uh, rather, I wanted to examine their resistance. And so I was looking at this notion of what I call Muslim counterpublics and youth activism and resistance through the arts. So I hope to touch on all of these things as we go through the presentation today. But I'll start with the basics because there's often a lot of confusion around the term Islamophobia. And I just wanna point out a few things and I do provide in my book, the definition that I use for Islamophobia and it's rather the framework for the book as well. So first of all, it's important to understand that Islamophobia, unlike what the name itself might denote, is not an irrational fear or hatred of Islam. Rather, it is rooted in racial logic. So it simply isn't just about fear or hatred. There are deeper roots um, that we need to talk about. And it refers to demonizing Islam and Muslims, or anyone, of course, perceived to be Muslim, as we know that many people have been subject to Islamophobia who are not Muslim but are misperceived. Um, you know, Sikhs, for example, are a community that have also had to contend with that. 
And, you know, to challenge the critics of this term Islamophobia, and there are many, it does not mean that you cannot be critical of Islam as you would any other um, religion. Uh, and so, um, you know, a lot of people are also now wanting to replace the term Islamophobia with anti-Muslim racism. And um, in my view, anti-Muslim racism is a manifestation of Islamophobia. So we have the overarching framework of Islamophobia and, and anti-Muslim racism is talking about the discrimination and how it's enacted on Muslim bodies. But um, Islamophobia is rooted in the racialization of religion. And that helps us bridge those two concepts in terms of how racial markers are attached to particular religions. Um, but it also, when we talk about racism, you know, uh, Islamophobia, you could say also predates uh, racism, which emerged in the modern period. And it has a long history and genealogy rooted in colonialism and Orientalism, but also can go back to early Muslim communities that were persecuted for their beliefs. <clears throat> so in my view, Islamophobic hate and bigotry are translated into individual actions and that's underwritten by negative ideologies and stereotypes that find expression in systemic practices, including laws and policies. And for me, understanding Islamophobia as a system of oppression and understanding those dynamics is really important in terms of um, how we can name a, a, it as well as address it, right? It, the, how we describe or define something will then impact how we intervene in attempting to dismantle it. So understanding those individual ideological and systemic dimensions of Islamophobia for me are um, critical. <clears throat> it's also important to recognize how Islamophobia is intersectional. Uh, it's lived differently according to the specific social identities of Muslims. And there are different um, gendered and racial registers through which Islamophobia is experienced. So <clears throat> we can talk about gendered Islamophobia or specific forms of discrimination that are leveled at Muslim women that are rooted in colonial histories and negative Orientalist stereotypes. There's also anti-Arab racism, anti-Brown racism, and anti-Black racism that intersect uh, with Islamophobia. Now, Islamophobia in Canada, as I think everyone here knows, has had very deadly consequences. We look at uh, January 29th, 2017, and the deadly shooting at a Quebec City mosque that um, uh, killed six Muslim men after their evening prayers. And then on June 6th um, of last year in London, Ontario, when a Pakistani Canadian Muslim family were out for an evening stroll and were um, violently and brutally and dead, uh, mowed down by a truck driven by a white nationalist and four members representing three generations of that family um, were killed. And so Islamophobia in Canada has reached deadly proportions and it's even more um, vital now to begin to understand it, its various manifestations as well as its expressions and how it is affecting uh, Muslim communities. <clears throat> so just as a bit of illustration to talk about those dimensions of Islamophobia, uh, I just thought I would give uh, a little bit of a breakdown. When we talk about the individual acts, it's sort of like the tip of the iceberg, what we see when we talk about Islamophobia around issues of name calling, microaggressions, exclusion, physical and sexual harassment and violence, vandalism, hate crimes, and of course, the more deadly um, uh, expressions of Islamophobia um, that I just talked about in terms of the terrorist attacks. And we can see in the images here a swastika that was spray painted on a mosque in Edmonton. Um, the reports about Black Muslim women being attacked um, uh, in Edmonton, and also um, the pig's head that was left at the door of uh, the Quebec uh, mosque where the shooting took place. This was left a year in advance with a um, sign that says Bon Appetit. And just another visual example of some vandalism and defacement of um, posters of a Muslim woman who was running for a um, uh, school trustee. So go, moving from those individual acts, there are also the ideologies that um, are important to understand as they underpin Islamophobia and, um, you know, are uh, justifying and rationalizing those particular kinds of practices. 
Uh, and there's many, many uh, um, discourses and conspiracy theories that I talk about as part of Islamophobia's playlist um, from the very kind of basic ones of Muslims are liberal, anti-democratic and incompatible with Canadian values to um, the ones about oppressed uh, Muslim women. Uh, but those discourses have gotten a lot more Im involved now, and we have a lot of conspiracy theories about the Islamist boogeyman, uh, you know, Muslims being a Trojan horse that are meant to um, invade as the fifth column within Western nations, eventually take over, install Sharia law, leading to a global caliphate, um, and also leading to demographic replacement or white genocide, and doing this through taqiyya or the ideas of deception, where, you know, basically they are wolves in sheep's clothing. And one of the strategies that's used um, within this, within these conspiracy theories is to weaponize the Quran and to take, um, you know, verses out of context to promote these particular kinds of um, narratives. But it's not just the far right echo chambers that have negative opinions about Muslims. Public policy, uh, sorry, public opinion polls in this country for the last two decades have painted a picture of a great deal of unease and suspicion about the Muslim presence in Canada. This is just a small sampling of some of the polls. Um, you know, of course, in 2017, after Donald Trump came into the into power south of the border and instituted uh, the Muslim ban. Uh, a poll was done in Canada and it found that almost a quarter of, of Canadians uh, would favor a ban on Muslim immigration in Canada. Um, the same poll revealed that 51% in Canada and 57% in Quebec felt that the presence of Muslims in this country made them somewhat or very worried about security. <clears throat> Excuse me, and when it came to uh, policies around, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, Muslim women's uh, attire, religious attire in the public sphere. Um, we know about the ones in Quebec, but there was also back in the Harper era an attempt to ban the niqab during uh, citizenship ceremonies. And it was found that about 72% agreed uh, with the, the our, uh, idea that the burqa and niqab so the face veil are symbols of oppression and rooted in a culture that is anti-woman. And then an earlier survey in 2012 found that basically uh, about 52% of Canadians distrust Muslims and 42% that uh, believe that discrimination against them is mainly their own fault. So we see some very troubling, um, uh, you know, statistics about public opinion, how it's negatively, um, you know, focused on Muslims as a source of um, angst and fear and um, and concern in, in the public domain. So a lot of those ideas and ideologies and attitudes find expression in um, policies in this country, and so those relate to the systemic factors of Islamophobia. And so, you know, we can talk about racial profiling in communities, borders, and schools, the fraught flying while Muslim, the no-fly list or passenger protect program, security policies um, like the Anti-Terrorism Act, security certificates, as well as the bans on religious attire in the public spheres. We know in Quebec, uh, Bill 21, um, the Barbaric Cultural Practices Act, uh, Quebec Charter of Values, as well as, you know, discrimination and employment, housing, health care, education, and social services. So those are all the ways in which um, the systemic um, forms of Islamophobia operate and sustain this dynamic of oppression. So I just wanted to share a bit of that breakdown, and that is something that I talk about in the book and I think is important to how we want to understand and situate Islamophobia. Um, another uh, dynamic that I want to speak just briefly about is how Islamophobia is organized. And what is really significant about Islamophobia, um, as opposed to other forms of oppression, is that there is an industry behind its promotion that is well-funded, well-orchestrated. This is the topic of a new report I have coming out um, in early October that looks at the Canadian Islamophobia industry and maps its ecosystem in the Great White North. And so the Islamophobia industry is comprised of a number of players that I've listed here, far-right media outlets, what I call Islamophobia influencers, 
far right white nationalist groups, pro Israel fringe right groups, Muslim dissidents and ex Muslims, and various think tanks and their designated security experts, along with the donors who fund these campaigns. And so these individuals and groups and institutions comprise a global network that supports activities that demonize and marginalize Islam and Muslims. So I'm not going to go into that um, right now, but I did want to flag it because it is part of the landscape and I'm trying to give us a bit of an overview of, of Islamophobia's landscape or ecosystem in Canada. Uh, and then, you know, finally, I, I, I proposed this notion of a liberal Islamophobia where you have the values of equity, diversity, and exclude, inclusion rather um, espoused and celebrated. At the same time, policies and practices are enacted that target Muslims as suspect or backward minorities. So there's kind of nexus of desire and disavowal almost where there's this sort of Islamophilia uh, marked by this sort of cultural fascination and fetishism or just multicultural celebratory multiculturalism kind of meets Islamophobia when it's uh, then, uh, you know, becomes referenced in these particular kinds of policies and so on. And so it spans across the political spectrum. Uh, liberal Islamophobia uh, can be an, it's a, you know, kind of a pervasive element of how um, the, uh, how uh, relations with Muslims are, are structured in the nation. And I would say more than the other extreme variants of Islamophobia, liberal Islamophobia does the work of normalizing anti-Muslim racism with greater legitimacy and institutional power. So that's a bit of just an overview of the landscape of Canada's to better situate um, the findings um, that I'm going to share with you of um, you know, my study and, and this book. And so in talking about how Muslim youth um, have grown up, this 9-11 generation of millennial youth, have grown up under the specter of all of these policies and practices. Um, that a lot were ushered in in that sort of state of exception after 9-11, as well as the global war on terror. Uh, one of the primary, uh, you know, concerns is the way that um, Muslims in general and Muslim youth in particular were bearing the collective guilt and responsibility for 9-11 and all other incidents of terror enacted by those who claim to have an affiliation with Islam. And, you know, that fact places profound demands on Muslim identities that become essentialized and reduced to negative categories of ascribed danger and suspicion. And so those narrow ontological spaces are constituted and referenced through, uh, you know, that repository of Orientalist tropes that leave little room for um, personal autonomy. And so as a result of this social and political positioning, Muslims find ways to forge and enact alternative narratives that work against these limiting um, discourses. So these narrative strategies are configured within the affective registers of Islamophobia, which shape the feelings, sensibilities, and dispositions of Muslims within the emotional geopolitics of the post 9-11 world. So, for example, publicly representing Islam and serving as an image corrective uh, by exhibiting positive behaviors and actions is one of the strategies that Muslim youth were employing, and that inculcates a sense of duty on the one hand to represent their faith in a positive light, to work against all the negative um, images and stereotypes and propaganda, um, but also it is part of a burden of responsibility that they bear. And so that nexus of representation and responsibility also plays out through this good Muslim, bad Muslim um, archetype that Mahmoud Mamdani proposed back in 2004. And this binary became a means of categorizing the characteristics ascribed to good Muslims as being, quote, modern, secular, westernized, while bad Muslims are doctrinal, anti-modern, and virulent. So these tropes gain currency through political rhetoric and media discourse and have left an imprint, not only on the public imaginary, but also on how Muslims have come to see themselves and shape their actions and responses. And so the imperative to perform and represent Islam positively is internalized as a burden of responsibility that many Muslim youth describe as being part of a social and political role that they fulfill, both consciously and unconsciously to distinguish themselves as good Muslims, as opposed to being feared, vilified, and surveilled as bad Muslims. 
And so, you know, in looking at the impact on identities within this, you know, kind of fraught context, <clears throat> I found that Muslim youth were either becoming more invested in their identities or becoming estranged from those identities in response. So as Muslim youth are forced into being ambassadors and protectors of the image of Islam, uh, at the same point in their lives where they're trying to negotiate their identities and understand the faith for themselves, their identities are you know, being shaped by engaging with these Islamophobic tropes, either by resisting and challenging or distancing from them. So that was another dynamic that I uh, found. So all of this is also impacted by the securitization of the environment in which they, they were coming of age and which they continue to be part of. And I talk about this as a, a securitized habitus. And I'm drawing here on, on Pierre Bourdieu, who describes the notion of habitus as enacting in the being enacted in the way that, quote, social order is progressively inscribed in people's minds. So it's the way that individuals perceive and react to the social worlds they inhabit. And so I contend that the post 9-11 condition in the West created a specific securitized habitus where Muslims in society in large have become conditioned to this fraught environment and the ideologies and practices that are produced by it. So these dynamics are internalized and in turn, um, produce specific behaviors, affective responses and shared experiences of alienation. And so <clears throat> the kind of vigilance that is exercised within this uh, securitized habitus uh, manifests in making conscious or unconscious decisions to modify one's clothing, bodily comportment and behavior, such as smiling more to not be seen as threatening, or checking what you might be carrying with you when you're traveling as you're getting on airplanes to avoid being seen as suspicious. And so all of that re results in a internalized Islamophobia and what I call this panopticon of self-surveillance. And so the surveillance practices that Muslims have endured since 9-11 has resulted in a panopticon effect where people become self-surveilling subjects, avoiding suspicion by second guessing and curtailing otherwise innocent actions for fear that they might be read as subversive. Um, and so I refer to the way that Muslim youth navigate the post 9-11 context as a panopticon of self-surveillance self where they are internalizing the regulatory gaze that they are subject to and hence become self-policing. So I'm going to go through, just give you uh, some slides here with some quotes from some of the participants in my study that exemplify these themes uh, because I want to center their voices and experiences and to give you something more than uh, just my overview of those things. So um, this is from Robley, who is a Somali youth worker. Um, and he says that uh, since 9-11, the focus has been on the religion and Muslimness and what it means vis-a-vis -vis the press coverage, where the focus is on those who are extremists and use Islamic language to further their agenda. This has also become linked with regular Muslim youth. So Muslim youth now have to answer the questions of terrorism, extremism, and not fitting in because they are extreme. They don't all belong to these categories, but they have to deal with that now. So if you're a religious youth who attends the mosque regularly and who wants to have a religiously centered life, the assumption is that you're an extremist. And we know that being religious and being extremist are not the same thing. Every time somebody blows something, blows up something in the world and they are Muslim, it is a reflection on their identity and that stereotypes and assumptions made against them. It could affect them in the workplace and in classrooms. And indeed it does. These kinds of meanings that are attached to Muslim bodies are something that um, does carry with them in uh, you know, every facet of their life. And the luxury of being seen as an individual is one that is not afforded to racialized communities who are often um, viewed as a collective. And um, so that is another experience of this sort of collective labeling. And so Sikandar, a Bengali student in Ontario said that, you know, I guess the single big biggest negative impact was that the mainstream majority now probably suspects every other young Muslim male with a ba basketball jersey or an engineering degree to be a potential truck bomber. 
And so he's picking up on his own experiences as someone who is actually in an engineering program and the way in which anyone, you know, bearing these degrees, especially if they're foreign, you know, international students coming, there's a perception that, you know, they might be trying to gain those skills in order to uh, plan some sort of a bomb attack or something. So um, that was one of the um, ways in which that labeling was discussed. And so, um, you know, Atika, a Bengali in, uh, international student in New Brunswick, put it this way, because if you're Muslim, you're taking on the burden of the whole Muslim world. And so just in that one sentence, she represents the kind of sense of actually having to carry that representation with you, that whatever you do as a Muslim uh, is not you as an individual doing it. It is something that will reflect uh, potentially negatively upon your entire community globally, which is over one and a half billion people. But that it, narrow essentialization is quite um, salient. And actually, Zahir had a good um, analysis of this. And he said, if you're white, you're simply an individual and you're separate from the rest of society. Whereas if you're Muslim and you're linked, uh, you are linked to the whole community. Concerning Islamophobia, it's a daily thing. A lot of work needs to be done to have accurate reporting in the media and have Canadians at large understand that Muslims are not terrorists blowing each other up or wife beaters. So he had a very you know, clear understanding of the fact that um, whatever he was going to do as a Muslim, uh, he didn't have the luxury of being seen as an individual. And that it would reflect on the entire community. Um, Sophia Somali, um, youth in Ontario, also spoke about this as a Muslim woman. Um, she said that when you're in public and you're wearing the hijab, you're extremely aware of every action you take. If you're in a bad mood and you're like scowling at everybody, right? Uh, you, you are Muslim. It's not just me having a bad day. I'm the Muslim girl. I don't just represent myself anymore. And so, again, that burden of responsibility and representation and needing to be that image corrective was something very pervasive um, as part of the experience of the 9-11 generation. So, yeah, more on the idea of this image corrective that they feel this responsibility to, you know, set the record straight <clears throat> and monitor their own behaviors. So Bushra says, you know, everything you do, you think of your religion first and how it impacts your religion like the way you act, you censor yourself so people don't see Islam uh, negatively. So you can see the sort of conscious choices and decisions that go into um, their everyday um, you know, choices and interactions and behaviors. And Miguel, a Latin American student in Montreal says, we should always be at our best at everything we do. And remember that as soon as we step out of our homes, we are Muslims. Your body language is really important. How you smile, walk, talk, just to monitor yourself on a constant basis is very important. We should always remember that we are responsible for the image of Islam. So you can see how many of them take on that responsibility and uh, moderate um, uh, self-monitor their own behavior as a result. So this goes back to the idea of sort of an investment or estrangement from identity. And while some become much more invested in their identities and as Muslims because they want to be that image corrective or they feel a responsibility um, to show, uh, you know, a different um, uh, representation of Islam. Others sometimes become estranged from it. And Mustafa, an African-American imam, uh, spoke about what I noticed is that the challenges confronting the youth in the post 9-11 context have garnered two very opposite responses. On one hand, I found that many Muslim youth have gotten much closer to their practice of Islam and their identification as Muslims. While on the other hand, because of the frequent abuses they've suffered as a result of their identification as Muslims, Many have assimilated so much into the mainstream identity that it's hard to identify them as Muslims. So that becomes another strategy of distancing oneself from a socially devalued identity. And that can happen through changing your name, anglicizing it, you know, Muhammad becomes Mo or, uh, you know, Osama becomes Sam, or you, um, you know, don't wear Islamic attire. You simply just don't identify um, because of the repercussions of doing so. And so, you know, those attitudes are not without, uh, you know, they're not just a sort of paranoia that these youth have. When we talk about securitization, um, the surveillance of Muslim youth uh, is something that is quite real and something we've seen on university campuses. <coughs> um, MSA presidents and executive members have been approached by CSIS, RCMP, and counterterrorism units of local police. Um, specific MSA groups have been under surveillance by security agencies. 
Uh, a recording device was discovered at the prayer room at the uh, Metro Toronto, um, Toronto University, formerly Ryerson. And Muslim youth are being recruited into CSIS and RCMP as well. This hit home for me when my son, who was the president of his, elected as president of his MSA, the very next day uh, got a phone call from CSIS on his cell phone. And, you know, nobody even knew who had won the election, but already CSIS was calling him the next day in the morning at like, you know, 8 a.m. Uh, to talk to him as president of that Muslim Student Association. So I sat in on that meeting and I've sat in on other meetings where Muslim Student as uh, Associations at my university were approached by counterterrorism um, units, um, RCMP and so on. And that has become, uh, you know, something that has uh, added a great deal to this climate of surveillance and leading to the kind of self-surveillance that I was speaking about. So as Zabeda says, I think that even when there isn't surveillance, we feel there is, and we're scared, we're on edge. So even if people aren't watching us, we feel the need to be on the lookout and we have to be on our best behavior. So you can see how that Islamophobic surveillance, again, becomes internalized and part of that self-surveilling um, subjects that Muslims uh, have become. So, um, and I'm gonna wrap up in about two minutes, but um, I also wanted to share a, a little bit more about uh, the securitized habitus that I spoke about and the fact that it is referenced, it isn't just, you know, again, paranoia. And Rania, a student at a university in Ontario says that, you know, there's like a designated counter-terrorist agent for the community and they wanna work with or have a good relationship with MSAs on our campus and on every campus. And I asked if, if this was only for Muslims. And he said, unfortunately, it is. In other words, he, they weren't interested in any other campus groups. Uh, and um, this targeting happens everywhere. In our university, we've had experiences with political movements, nothing huge, just suspicion. So securitization is a problem. But like, how do we figure out what is acceptable and what is not? It's difficult. It's disturbing. And so this points to, you know, how... Uh, Muslim youth require a, a certain political literacy to understand the, um, you know, what to do when CSIS comes knocking at your door, um, when CSIS calls you on your cell phone in the morning, and what your um, response uh, should be. And so um, that is something that all of a sudden they were quite um, having to confront in ways that they were not prepared for. And, you know, how could you be? And so Yusuf says here that it's not just how other people are going to see us, but how we see ourselves like how we internalize it. Even when we were planning the MSA retreat, we wanted to go in a forest and build a bonfire, but then we had to start thinking about that. And it's even kind of funny, we were joking that if somebody saw all of us vi visibly uh, Muslim folks showing up there, all kinds of suspicion would arise. So we internalize that fear. We have to monitor what we do so it doesn't come off as suspicious, even if it's not. So that's, uh, you know, example of that, those securitized habitus and those conditions that have now come to modify the behavior, dispositions and, and attitudes of uh, Muslim youth who have to reside within these um, conditions. So finally, um, I'm going to end here with, you know, I'm not going to have time to get too much into this, but my final chapter of the book um, starts to look at Muslim youth counter publics and arts-based resistance. Uh, again, because I wanted to end uh, the book in a way that uh, allows for Muslim youth to uh, be seen not as victims of circumstance, but as agentic subjects who are taking on um, different modalities of political resistance. And I was very interested in the arts and their role. So through storytelling, um, for example, contemporary voices of Muslim youth are added to a large historical repository of resistant Muslim narratives, right? So there is a legacy that they can draw on. And Muslim youth are representing their lives and experiences in ways that subvert these sort of old colonial uh, and not so old colonial and imperial scripts. So I interviewed Muslim cultural producers. Um, uh, there were spoken word artists, uh, filmmakers, um, actors, uh, theater group called Conflict Relief, which was a uh, Israeli-Palestinian um, theater company uh, that tried to, you know, bring out some of the issues in that conflict using humor, but also then going out into the audience and talking to people and engaging conversations as a form of a uh, sort of an anti-colonial public pedagogy. 
Um, you know, I also, also um, interviewed other youth artists that were involved in a variety of ways, filmmakers. This is actually my son's film, I Am Rohingya, Genocide in Four Acts, where he worked with local um, Rohingya youth in the Kitchener-Waterloo area to develop a four-act play about their experiences, the experiences of their family <clears throat> through the genocide in Burma, through being in refugee camps in Bangladesh and then coming to Canada. And it's really important that those diverse stories of Muslim youth are heard and are, are known as also a project to reveal their resilience and their agency within um, you know, the, the various kinds of oppression that they are facing. And so I'll just leave that there. And of course, this is, I got this um, Islamophobin that CARE used to put out as this, I actually have it somewhere on the back of my shelf and it, it actually is gum, but I always thought it's kind of a funny way to end off a very um, difficult conversation uh, uh, about some of these, uh, you know, um, about all of the these factors that contribute to an Islamophobic environment. So as we turn our attention to uh, challenging Islamophobia, it's not as simple as, as uh, you know, uh, taking two of these Islamophobin, but I think we need to start having those conversations and hopefully this um, intervention uh, that I've done will help us on that path. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jasmine. Oh wow, <laughs> great talk, so much to unpack. Uh, okay, we're, we're open for questions. We got about 15 minutes or so. Uh, so if you'd like to ask a question, feel free to just raise your virtual hand or to post in the chat that you'd like to, question, to ask a question. Uh, the floor is open. Um, I'm not seeing any hand, hands raised or questions yet, so maybe I'll I'll get us started and, and break the ice because you know I've got a thousand questions, but <laughs> I won't ask them; it'll take forever. But what I would really like to come back to, Jasmine, is the that that concept and phenomenon of liberal Islamophobia, right? Because we hear a lot now in the media about far right extremism and and all all the violent acts that far right groups have been committing, and and they're obviously very impactful and very important, but there is this other type of Islamophobia that you talk about and that I've kind of seen through some of the polling data that I work with um, uh, that's coming more from people who think they're liberal minded or who have more liberal cosmopolitan values, um, but that discomfort towards Islam is still there. And so I, I'd like to ask you, you know, how, how do you go about measuring this phenomenon empirically, this liberal Islamophobia? How do you how do you show that it's there? Because you know those who hold those values don't see see it as Islamophobia, and it's hard to convince them that it is Islamophobia. And and how would you recommend going about addressing it or beginning to address it? Mm. Thank you for that, Sarah. And actually, your your work on the polls was uh, something that I drew upon in both uh, my book and in the report on the Islamophobia industry. And so, you know, that gave us some barometer of looking beyond the far right echo chambers and white nationalist, um, you know, um, chatter in their their groups and their ideologies to seeing how anti-Muslim racism and Islamophobia was more widely expressed, you know, in Canadian society. So it isn't just something that is in the domain of these extremes. And so we distilled the polls from 2004 to the present uh, in Canada, public opinion polls, both nationally as well as in Quebec. And it paints a, you know, a very problematic picture. Those were just a couple of highlights that I shared. And there's a very consistent narrative that is showing pervasive you know, distrust of of Muslims and a low evaluation of Islam vis-a-vis -vis other um, faiths and faith communities and so on, and a very you know, stereotypical view of Muslim women and, and all of these sorts of things. And so that's public opinion on the one hand, which is really troubling. Um, uh, on the other hand, there's also, you know, what I talk about when I sort of reference the idea of liberal Islamophobia is that, you know, we have this celebratory multiculturalism in Canada, right? It's the Let's go, okay, October, it's Islamic History Month. You know, we have multicultural festivals, sari, samosas, and steel bands. And this is how we do multiculturalism in Canada. And it is a smokescreen, really, that masks a great deal of structural um, racism and inequality, which upon which the white settler nation was built and continues to be structured. And um, you have this sort of liberal rhetoric and celebratory multiculturalism. Okay, yeah, let's have Islamic um, History Month and let's have these, you know, fair festivals and celebrations and all of this going on. And, and you know, 
say all the right things, make, you know, state public statements about that. And then on the other hand, let's have all of these policies like security certificates, which have been enacted against, you know, uh, Muslims, five Muslim men have been held, you know, uh, indefinitely um, subject to secret trials and secret evidence, right? The secret trial five you've got, uh, and that's the security certificates. You have no fly lists with Muslim toddlers on there. On there. You have, um, uh, you know, the Anti-Terror Act, you've got uh, all, you know, practices. I mean, I was just talking about the securitization of Muslim youth and how the RCMP are showing up. Uh, you know, these kinds of policies and practices are, uh, you know, uh, in contrast to the rhetoric and to the idea of this multicultural, you know, um, utopia. And so to me, it's that paradox, you know, where on the one hand, there's all of that sort of cultural fascination with Muslims, the celebration, the sort of Islamophilia, and then the Islamophobia is right there in the background. So I see it that way. And uh, I don't know how you would actually go about, um, you know, kind of examining this empirically. And that really wasn't my uh, intent. I think, you know, we tried, I tried to show uh, more broadly how you have those policies and practices in place. And of course, we, you know, what we see publicly as is the celebratory uh, nature. And I do think that that is, more impactful when it comes to normalizing Islamophobia than simply, you know, what rebel media is doing, right? Not that that's not significant and, and the whole networks around Islamophobia are quite significant, but, um, you know, they exist within this broader ecosystem of which liberal Islamophobia um, is also a part. Mm. Yeah. Okay, uh, I've, I've got some comments and, and questions in the chat. Uh, Louis, would you like to ask your question? Would you like to, you're welcome to ask it yourself. Louis? Yeah, no, I'd rather you, you read it than- Okay, I'll read it. <laughs> no worries. Okay, so Louis asks, uh, do you think that the events that happened in Iran uh, where Masa Amini was killed will affect or cause more Islamophobia? So, I mean, to answer your question a lot more broadly than focusing on one particular instance, anything that um, happens in the Muslim world, uh, you know, that, it, and there's a lot of negative things and a lot of problematic things and a lot of gendered violence and a lot of homophobia and a lot of all sorts of things that go on there. Um, those are number one, not only happening in the Muslim world. However, they will of course be used to fodder more Islamophobia, um, you know, and, you know, I, I'm tempted to say in the West, but of course we can't talk about Islamophobia as just something that happens in the West now, because we have to look at what's happening in China and in Burma and in India and in Palestine and everywhere else. But um, yes, the, uh, particularly the Islamophobia industry type actors and others will, you know, dine out on all of those stories because they're only interested in presenting, um, you know, this very, um, very narrow um, view of Muslims as being, uh, you know, um, violent, as being um, a threat to democracy, freedom, and um, all of the values that the West espouses and so on. So yes, it will be used. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Walter, you had kind of a comment, question, would you like to share? Say it. Um, yeah, um, I mean, there's not much that I can add to it. Um, I'm actually involved in my PhD in uh, women in Islam. And um, I'm recently uh, jumped into the circle of faith of uh, Muslimhood. And after years of studies, I just um, noticed that there is no much that I can do instead of thinking globally or within my community, all I can do for now is just focus on myself and how I reflect my persona within the circle of people that I know. There's no much else I can do. Um, however, um, yes, I can contribute with my, you know, research or papers or anything that I can write, post, but I think by giving um, an example of a good person and good Muslim will actually make up a great deal to change people's mind. Again, and going back to the original conundrum, there's not much I can do if the person in front of me does not want to think. 
I can't control anything about that, but I do find um, Dr. Zin's um, book very, very intriguing. So I'm looking forward to have it on my, my nightstand to read it back to back. Thank you so much, uh, Walter. And for your comments and observations, I think you're right. You know, um, when it comes to our, you know, the circles that we are within, you will be confronted, you know, with people that are, um, you know, maybe Islamophobic or have harbored some of those, you know, biases and so on, simply because of what's out there. And it's very easy to take on board uh, those particular kinds of biases. They tend to become dominant and hegemonic as we've seen. So what do you do as an individual who wants to challenge that? And, you know, you can't always, um, you know, win an argument. I'm actually not at all interested in, in winning an argument of any kind. Mm -hmm. That's not what I'm uh, doing. Um, but as you say, and as many of my participants said, it really is about just showing people who they really are, you know, and so a lot of this image corrective and sort of that burden of responsibility, it's not disingenuous. It is showing people who we really are. They're not, they may be more conscious of outwardly making sure that they, you know, do things like smile more, give up their seat on the subway and, you know, things like that. But those aren't things that aren't part of Islamic ethics to begin with, right? Mm -hmm. um, so it is not uh, something that they're putting on, it is something that they just want to assert more as a counter and as a corrective. So, you know, as individuals, I think, you know, uh, you know, for Muslims themselves, first of all, the burden of challenging Islamophobia should not only be on the backs of, of Muslims, right? I agree. So, we do have right. to build broader solidarities and alliances, and that's what's lacking. Uh, you know, the lack of social movements galvanizing around Islamophobia to me is a key issue. Um, mm -hmm. When we talk about other forms of racism, like anti-Black racism, like anti-Indigenous racism, you know, they have those communities have over the years and centuries of their own struggles come together to form social movements like I Don't Know More and Black Lives Matter. And, you know, they were able to bring those issues into public consciousness in really profound and important ways. That's not been done with Islamophobia, despite the fact that it is a global manifestation that ranges from genocide, ethnic cleansing, state repression to um, all of the other kinds of issues that I've been talking about, you know, here in Canada, including terrorist uh, attacks. So that is lacking. And so I think that that's where I would see more... Um, movement, uh, you know, being need to uh, so, uh, more momentum happening yeah. and something concerted, because as I said, Islamophobia is organized. You know, my next report next month will show exactly in detail how it's organized. We also need to organize in order to combat it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, Ekram had a question in the chat. Would you like to ask your question, Ekram? Yeah, sure. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Justin, for this uh, very beautiful presentation. Actually, I have a question about, uh, we have noticed lately, or it, it, maybe it had been for a while, uh, that there are many programs and uh, initiatives that's organized by um, non-profit organizations or community groups to tackle Islamophobia. Uh, for example, Together Against Islamophobia, uh, Islamophobia 101 and uh, other programs. Uh, do you think these programs have a positive impact in tackling Islamophobia, or do we need um, do we need to uh, work more as a community, as Muslim community, as as larger community to um, address this this issue, or is awareness? Um, maybe we need a law. Maybe to I'm not sure if there is a law for uh, to criminalize Islamophobia. But um, yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Those are all great initiatives, uh, you know, and I think they've benefited from some more recent funding that the federal government put out in the wake of the London terror attack. So I know some community organizations have been trying to do a lot of work. I know in KW, Coalition of Muslim Women has done great work. Um, and so, yes, it's important for grassroots organizations to be out there doing what they can with the limited resources that they have, because, you know, that pot of money is going to be gone after, you know, people start to forget about whatever has happened in relation to Islamophobia in Canada. So they need the resources to continue that work. Um, <clears throat> but as I said, I think that we need to build solidarities and alliances and actually have a movement behind um, challenging Islamophobia. So everything counts, you know, from what Walter was saying in terms of those small acts of subversion, which is simply about showing who you really are to challenge 
all of those, um, you know, attitudes and biases and preconceptions that are out there, the long history of tropes and stereotypes that shape our encounters, uh, to what you're talking about and the role of community organizations in the grassroots doing what they can, and to the responsibility of the government. Uh, obviously, there are, you know, laws of human rights policies and, you know, hate crime and uh, hate speech laws and so on. Um, but I think the real work is um, not just going, you know, the real change isn't going to just come through legislation. There also, it's not just top down, it has to be bottom up. And there's a lot more, I think, that can be done to raise awareness about Islamophobia. But, um, you know, we need to work and learn from the struggles of other communities in terms of how we can uh, mobilize. Okay, um, Aisha, sorry, thank you. Aisha has a question in the chat. Would you like to ask, or two questions? Would you like to ask your questions, Aisha? Okay, thank you so much. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Zin, uh, and uh, good, good evening, everyone. So um, uh, it, it was a great uh, learning opportunity. Thank you so much, for, uh, Dr. Zin, for your uh, you know inspiring work. Uh, when listening to your presentation, actually two questions came to my mind, and I wanted to share with you just in case um, you know it can provoke further uh, research or thinking around them. Uh, the first one was, um, I was wondering how similarly or differently um, uh, the international and versus domestic Muslim university students were navigating, um, you know, uh, the post 9-11 landscape here in Canada, mm -hmm. especially when they're working together uh, under their MSAs. Mm -hmm. And also the second uh, question was, um, you were talking about this uh, uh, panopticon, right? Mm -hmm. Self-surveillance. Uh, so how the rise of, uh, of a panopticon of self-surveillance affect Muslim youth's spirituality, considering that Muslims are supposed to be the best versions of themselves, both privately and publicly, uh, only for the sake of Allah, um, you know, um, but nobody else. So uh, do you think that this, uh, uh, you know, post 9-11, you know, uh, will have some implications on their spirituality on the run, run, long run as well. All right, great. Thank you for those questions. To respond to the first question, I, you know, I did talk to some international students as well as uh, domestic students. And I think the issue always with international students is that they <clears throat> feel far more precarious. They're less likely to um, come forward if they're subject to, uh, you know, Islamophobic incidents and things like that, um, they're no less concerned about it. Uh, but, you know, they come more with the goal that I'm here to study and, you know, I don't want anything to disrupt that. And so they're very aware and rightly so of how um, being, you know, seen as foreign can impact how, um, you know, they are viewed. And so, you know, the conversations um, that I had with them, you know, uh, kind of expressed some of that and some of their own, um, you know, additional fears um, as a response. So, so yeah, so um, that was the one issue about international students and their greater precarity in these circumstances. Um, as far as the panopticon of self-surveillance, I mean, I think, you know, uh, when it comes to spirituality, like I said, I don't think this, the fact that they were showing themselves as good Muslims was performative in a sense of being disingenuous. It was simply being more um, aware that they express the, the, the best part of themselves, as you say, right, the best versions of themselves a lot more publicly as a way of having to, uh, a way of countering a lot of the negative stereotypes. And frankly, as a way of survival, too, because, you know, you don't want to be seen through this negative prism, whether in your workplace or school or whatever, because we know Islamophobia is going to impact you and your ability to access safe and affordable housing, your ability to get a job, your ability to get promotion, um, you know, throughout every facet of your life. It's going to um, be something that you'll encounter. And so that impetus to want to challenge it by presenting a different narrative, you know, is not, um, I think, unusual in terms of um, how youth in this particular situation might want to address, you know, the kinds of challenges they're facing. Okay, and we have one last question for today coming from Alicia Cummins, who's been patiently waiting with her virtual hand raised. Go for it, Alicia. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you, Jasmine, for um, you know for your talk today and for this book. I'm so excited um, to read it. Um, I found a lot of similarities with what you were saying and how 
um, Muslims are constructing their identity in the context of Islamophobia um, and my own research on Ismaili Muslims and how they're constructing um, their Ismaili identity in the context of Islamophobia, but also Takfirism. Um, so, you know, uh, informal, formal, um, you know, um, efforts to um, um, to nuance ideas about being Muslim. I'm, I, but I'm, what I'm wondering, um, that, and I, I, you didn't, I don't think you talked much about this in this presentation, but I, what I want to know is how the harm of Islamophobia, the internalization of Islamophobia, how, what are, what are some of the effects, um, in terms of, um, like in my own research, I find that, um, you know, you may be more hesitant to engage with outgroups. And so what are the long-term effects, do you think, um, um, Islamophobia, is going, Islamophobia is going to have on Muslim identity? Yeah, thank you um, for that question. Uh, you know, it's interesting because I was looking at the millennial generation of the 9-11 generation. So that group of youth that didn't know a whole lot about the world before, you know, they knew a little bit, but not that much. So uh, a lot of the times in their experience, you know, I would ask them, well, okay, how did 9-11 affect you? And they'd say things like, well, no, it didn't really affect me. And then I'd say, okay, but then, all right, so what are your student groups doing, your Muslim Student Association? Oh, well, we were going to go play paintball, but we don't want to be seen as terrorists. Then I would think, oh, okay, but 9-11 didn't affect you, right? Uh, or they'd say, yeah, well, we don't play violent video games in public because we don't want people to think that we're plotting an attack or something or think that we're violent. I would say, oh, okay, yeah, but then 9-11 didn't affect you, right? So, you know, that's an example to say that a lot of it was normalized for this generation. And so they often didn't understand because that's just the new normal. That's just how they navigate the world, right? So now looking at, I guess, maybe the youth you're talking, and I don't know if you're talking about, if you're talking to youth or the community at large, but um, when I look at Gen Z students in my classrooms, you know, um, they're a lot more, uh, you know, distant from the impact of 9-11 directly, but they also have this point of view where they can look backwards and they can see what, you know, their siblings went through or others went through. So they are able to, to see that. And I think, you know, are also interested in trying to challenge that. So I didn't see for example, an inhibition to not wanting to reach out to other groups. In fact, um, you know, I, I, I mean, I was in one of the um, chapters, you know, did look at how they were trying to across campuses, work with other campus groups and build those alliances and so on, on issues of, of common interest or, you know, around Islamophobia and so on. So I didn't see this sort of insularity. That insularity was uh, a lot more likely, you know, and it does happen, right, where people are afraid. I mean, you know, when 9-11 happened, I was wearing hijab back then and I didn't leave my house for like a week or so, you know. Um, so there are, there are times where communities will retreat and become more insular, but I think this generation, um, uh, you know, now the millennials are much older. They're, you know, um, also being able to reflect on the situations that they've encountered. Gen Z are kind of looking backward and seeing what others have gone through. And it's not like they're not experiencing things either. It's not like all of a sudden it's over, you know, Islamophobia. They're also experiencing it. So I'm hearing a lot of the same stories uh, from Gen Z students in my classrooms, uh, as I heard from, you know, those that I interviewed. Um, so you're right. I mean, becoming insular can be a byproduct of, you know, this particular kind of racism and, and uh, um, securitization and surveillance and being seen as, you know, what I talked about in the book uh, as the folk devil around which these moral panics become constructed. And so definitely internalizing that does, you know, take its toll. But as I, you know, and why I ended the book with resistance was because I wanted to focus on that, those spaces of resilience, those spaces of mobilization and, um, you know, ways that they assert their identity in, in um, very positive ways and, um, and in ways that are consciously, you know, trying to address and their experiences and, and um, create alternative narratives and therefore imagine alternative futures. And I think that's very hopeful. Okay, thank you so much once again, Jasmine. I've got a couple of slides to share before we head out. So Jasmine, can I just ask you to bring your slides down and I'll share my slides. So if you'd like your own copy, your very own copy of Jasmine's book, I just put the link uh, to McGill Queen's University Press uh, page uh, in the chat. So it's there again. So if you'd like to get your own copy, you can follow that link. Um, and just wanted to mention, so Jasmine's book is part of um, a larger 
book series that we have called Advancing Studies in Religion with McGill Queen's University Press. Uh, I'm fortunate for the next couple of years to be the book series editor. And so uh, I've put the link up here or you can just Google, Google it. And we've got lots of great titles, including Jasmine's uh, book, which is our most recent release. And so go check them out if you're interested. Uh, I think there's some of the kind of some really quality works on the study of religion, maybe a bit more with a Canadian focus, but also uh, more broadly than that. Uh, so please do go and have a look. And if you yourself have a manuscript in mind that you're that's in the works that you're working on, we all have that book uh, that we've always wanted to write, uh, let me know because I'm interested in publishing it as well, right? So we publish kind of studies uh, on religion at the cutting edge um, of the field of especially religious studies, but also other related fields um, that are tied to the study of religion. And as well, uh, one more thing to mention, we're going to have our next TSSR fall webinar uh, around the start of uh, November, so on no November 4th, and um, this webinar will be titled Les Hira, Portraits socio-religieux d'une communauté étrangère uh, sud-asiatique. It'll be with Mathieu Boisvert, and so he's going to be talking about his new book. Uh, the presentation will be in French, but Mathieu is fully bilingual, so he's happy to answer any of your questions in English uh, as well during the webinar if you're interested. So if you if you like to attend that event, we'll be posting details about it on our website shortly. We don't quite have the registration page up yet, um, but do check the CSSR webpage. I've again put the link here on the slide and uh, we'll send it around the usual channels uh, to advertise the event as well in a couple of weeks. Okay, so that's it for me. Uh, thanks once again to Jasmine. Big round of applause and to all of you who are here and asked wonderful questions. Um, and I wish you all a happy uh, continuation of the fall. Good luck with the hurricane out east. <laughs> Fingers crossed it's okay. And uh, hopefully see you around uh, at our next uh, CSR. CSR. SSR webinars. Bye, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Bye. 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 All the best. Thank you.